Hello everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. I'm your host, Jason Aiken. And joining me for this week's episode is author Christopher Paul Carey. Hi Chris, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Jason? Oh, pretty good. Glad to have you on the show, and we're going to talk about the new restored edition of Philip Jose Farber's Flight to Opar. Excellent. Uh, I just want to say I'm a big fan of Pulp Crazy and and listen to every episode and have learned a lot from from it. I, I've read a lot of Pulps too, but um, you hit a lot of stuff that I haven't been exposed to, so it's, it's a, a great resource. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate you saying that. Every word is true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess first we should so, say is uh, Flight to Opar, the pre-order page for it's up on the Meteor House website right now. And it's actually due, if all goes, if it all goes according to plan, it's supposed to come out this summer at Pulp Fest 2015 in Columbus, Ohio. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, so it'll... it'll uh should, if everything goes well, make its debut there. There should be a, a few other farmer-related products coming out, too, that we might want to mention at the, at the maybe at the end of the program. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. I'll happy to discuss why I'm so excited about this, this edition of the book. Oh, excellent. And uh, do you want to give kind of a brief overview of what the Kokarsa, or sometimes it's known as Ancient Opar series, is about? Sure. Um, the the Kokarsa series uh, is a series by uh, science fiction fantasy author Philip is a farmer. Um, he first came up with the idea to write this series in the early 1970s uh, when he was... Uh, corresponding with some Edgar Rice Burroughs fans um, who had written uh, a monograph basically on the lost city of Opar um, from Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan novels. Uh, there was an article that they wrote called Heritage of the Flaming God. And in that article, they posited that uh, the lost cities from Tarzan's Africa uh, were probably actually some, they were connected to a larger civilization. So they were all cities of a larger empire, if you will. And uh, that idea very much intrigued Farmer, who uh, started thinking, you know, as a science fiction writer and somebody who is interested in uh, uh, Uchronia, I guess is the term for it, uh, where you have a uh, kind of an alternate past, um, or, you know, almost like a hidden secret history past, actually, in Farmer's case. Uh, he started thinking of how this civilization uh, would have arisen uh, and how the different cities from from uh, the Tarzan books, uh, that the lost cities, might have been connected. And he also connected it with the uh, the works of H. Ryder Haggard, who also had a character, multiple characters, but one in particular, Alan Quatermain, who uh, traveled around Africa. He was a, a hunter uh, and uh, discovered also several different lost, uh, lost cities that Farmer posited were actually part of the same empire. As the as the cities from the Tarzan novels, so he he started working on this. The first record I think that I have of him working on it, uh, corresponding with uh, oh I should mention the names of the Burroughs fans. It was uh, uh, Frank Breckel and John Harwood, um, and Phil started corresponding with them. And the first record I have I think is 1972. Um, the first Opar book. Hadon of ancient Opar, that's how Phil pronounced the hero's name, Hadon. A lot of people say Hayden or Hadon or 
different <laughs> different pronunciations, but <laughs> but Phil actually worked out the linguistics of, of the Kokarsan language, the Kokarsa being the, the empire uh, in in Africa, in ancient Africa. Um, and so he uh, the, the first novel is Hadon of Ancient Opar, came out in nineteen seventy four, was published by Daw Books. Um, the famous yellow-spined books from the 1970s. Uh, and uh, it followed the adventures of the hero Hadon, who uh, was uh, from the city of Opar, and he goes and travels to the capital of the empire, uh, to the island of Kokarsa, uh, and the city is also named Kokarsa, uh, as is the empire. So <laughs> you have a lot of different Kokarsas going on there. Uh, he travels there uh, to compete in a, in a tournament, the Great Games, for the chance to become king of the empire and to marry the queen. Um, and there's kind of a, an Olympics-like um, contest going on. He, he was one of the victors from the lesser games in Opar, so he was sent to the capital to compete and uh, uh, he does so. Uh, I'll, I'll spoil <laughs> spoil the book since we're talking about the sequel. Uh, presumably, uh, people will have already read that book. But uh, he he wins, but he does not become king because there is uh, the current king, who is the father of the current queen. Uh, uh, basically sends him on a mission out into the wildlands to thwart him from becoming king. So the, the rules of succession say that um, since his... It's a matriarchy, I should explain, uh, the, the civilization. Uh, and so the reason that they're selecting a new king is because the queen has died. So... Uh, the rules of succession would then give the the queenship to the king's daughter, who is the person that Hadon would have married uh, had his had her, the queen's father allowed it. Um, so he gets sent off on a quest to find a group of travelers who who are said to be under the protection of a living god named Sahindar, and Sahindar may be very familiar to readers of Burroughs. He's a jungle lord type character, travels around with a monkey on his shoulder, has a scar running across his forehead. Um, so that may, that may give you some clues as to his, his identity. Right. Um, <laughs> so he goes on this quest to, to uh, retrieve these people who were under Sakindar's protection um, who had been traveling, basically Sahindar left them off uh, under under the protection of a Kokarsan expedition that had gone out exploring into the wild lands. And then that expedition was attacked by, uh, by uh, a tribe, basically, from, from outside the empire and, and slaughtered, all except for one man who came back and told the story who accompanies Hadon then on the expedition to retrieve these people. Um, so, and there's also uh, an axe that Hadon is told to to find out about. Uh, one of the one of the one of Sahindar's companions had been carrying this strange axe that was said to be forged from a falling star. And so, one of the reasons that uh, Hadon is sent out is because the oracle of Kokarsa actually is the one that decrees that he must do this. So it's a good pretext for the king to hold on to his power in the meantime. The oracle had actually said the greatest hero of the land must go go uh, retrieve these people and the axe. Uh, and so Minruth, of course, decided that that meant that was Hadon, since he had just won the, the great games. So, many adventures ensue. 
and uh, Hadan does r retrieve uh, Sahindar's companions, returns to the empire. He should, for all rights, be king, be crowned king at that point. Uh, but he finds that Meenruth, King Meenruth, has uh, basically revolted and tried to overthrow the matriarchy. Right. Uh, and, and so there's a great civil war going on. Hadon is imprisoned. Uh, he also, I should mention, meets out in the wildlands his cousin Kwasin, who's a, a, a giant, <laughs> a, a kind of a giant barbarian, Conan type of a guy. So they all get imprisoned, they escape, and at the end of Hadon of ancient Opar, it's a, it's a real cliffhanger. You've got Hadon standing in the middle of a pass, of a mountain pass, um, a highly def defensible mountain pass, where, whereby he's allowing the other, his companions, to escape, and he's going to sacrifice his life for them. And so, like, at the very end, he, he's just standing there with his sword, waiting for an army to come take him out, basically. And so that's where Flight to Opar picks up. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's quite a good novel. Um, and uh, I probably won't spoil anything about Flight to Opar very much, uh, except to say that he has sent on another quest by an oracle, um, by the oracle, and he uh, it's sent to go back to his home city of Opar, where uh, it, uh, his current lover, uh, Lalila, who uh, has a name strikingly similar to uh, another Lalila <laughs> from a book, Alan, Alan and the Ice Gods by H. Ryder Haggard, which can kind of be seen as a prequel to the Kokarsa series. Um, that's, also, sent, that's also oh, where the... Um, Axe was forged, you could say, in that book as well, right? Yes, there's a, there's a character named Pog, who appears in Farmer's book as Paga, uh, and Lalila, it's spelled L-A-L-E-E-L-A, -E -E and Haggard, and it's spelled L-A-L-I-L-A -L -L in Farmer. <laughs> so, uh, Basically, he has fallen in love with Lalila, uh, this character who ultimately derives from Haggard, and is um, they they conceive together, and the oracle tells them that they must return to Opar and that the child must be born in Opar, or else very bad things will happen. Um, but if but if the child is born there then that child will be the savior of Opar one day and will found a dynasty that will last for thousands of years. So that is that is the basically the plot of, of uh, Flight to Opar. And uh, so very ex very excited for this book to be reprinted because not only is it a good book, but we have uh, found... We've located Farmer's original manuscript in a university collection and discovered that uh, there was quite a bit of text that was cut out by the editor at DAW uh, that was not really cut out for any good reason other than to shorten the book, right. uh, probably for the economics of, of printing. So and, that's, and from what I understand... There was a lot of good quality Formarian lore that was part of this. I think you guys, um, looks like it says on the Meteor House website, this is going to feature nearly 4,000 words that were cut from the original manuscript. And that's actually, that's a good bit of words there. That's about as long as a short, as some short stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it is al almost precisely four thousand. I think it's like I think it ended up being three thousand nine hundred and ninety five words. Oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> we were almost able to say over four thousand words. But uh, uh, yeah, and it's it's some good stuff, and it's it's very Farmerian type stuff. You know, uh, it's it's details. Uh, 
world building details, uh, um, things where he was tying it in further with the, the Burroughs mythos. Um, you know, uh, there were some scenes of violence that were toned down. Uh, we we know that Phil was not a real real big fan of uh, of editors doing such things to his novels because it had happened before to some of his other stories. Um, in particular, the novel The Gate of Time, one of his early novels. Um, the there was a lot of scenes of violence were cut out or or toned down significantly, and later he re he. Later, because he was so displeased with that, uh, he released a new edition of that book under the title Two Hawks from Earth. So, uh, so a similar situation happened in a couple different scenes in Flight to Ophar. So those have been restored. So all of that text, all oh, the extra cool. text, and some of the changed text um, that was actually changing the content um, have been restored. Now, the the I want to say this for you know for whoever the DAW editor was. I don't know if it was Donald Wolheim or or, or some you know who el who else he had working for him. Uh, very very good edits. Uh, I'm I'm a professional editor myself. I've done a lot of copy editing. Um, very very sharp edits. I don't want to in any way imply that. Uh, those edits were poor and those edits were undone. I've left the substantial amount of the copy edits, um, you know, the tightening up of language and, and stuff like that is retained in this edition. I didn't undo any of that kind of line edit type stuff. It was primarily restoring, um, restoring the deleted passages. There were some minor, minor things that, that I, that I took care of to, um, sync the styles up, some capitalization issues, and some super minor stuff that no one else will notice, but but me basically. Um, so uh, I can go into some of uh, some of those the the details of the material that we're restoring. If you're interested in that. Oh, definitely. Um, so I. I Written, I have my, my preface to the restored edition here in front of me, so I'm going to kind of go through here because I synopsize a lot of the changes in that. Um, just to, I wanted to record it for the historical record so that people knew exactly what we did to the text. Um, and, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is the definitive edition of the book. It's far closer to Farmer's original vision for the novel. And hopefully in the future, years down the road, this will be used as the text to go to for, for future reprints and things like that. Um, so so we, we learn a lot of uh, good stuff. So I, I should say I was the author, uh, co-author with um, Phil of the third novel in the series, the novel after Flato, or the Song of Kwasin, which came out in, a, in an omnibus called Gods of Opar in... 2012 from Subterranean Press. So I'm extremely tuned into a lot of the world building, um, and a, a lot of it just jumps out at me. So when I saw saw the material that was cut, in a lot of cases, I was <laughs> I was just very displeased because it was it, it was the kind of thing that I could have used when I was was writing the Song of Quasin or some of the other Kokarsa related stories that I've done since then. Um, things like um, you find out what the a lot of little details, but some also larger passages. But like you find out what the the robes of the priests of Rezu, the sun god, um, they're the ones who are revolting against the matriarchy. You know, they they have tasseled bright yellow scarlet slashed robes, which is kind of cool because that's actually they're trying to show. The, with the tasseled bright yellow and scarlet slash, that's basically describing the sun, which is their god, Rezu, the sun god. Right. Um, and uh, and uh, we, pro we probably should mention um, the two major deities in uh, yes. Kokarsa, because you mentioned Rezu, the sun god, 
yeah. which is who the priests worship, but the priestesses they have a their own mother goddess, right? Yes. The, so the mother goddess is named Ko, K H O. That's where Ko, the Ko in Kokarsa comes from, um, and uh, it's basically the it's the the mother goddess from from mythology, um, you know, like you know Venus. Venus of Willendorf kind of uh, uh, goddess. Like Robert Graves wrote a book called The White Goddess, which was an inspiration for for Phil when when he was writing this this series. Um, uh, so you have the the mother goddess being um, overseen by the the priestesses and the queen of Kokarsa, and then you have the priests of Rezu. Who is the province of the king and the and uh, the priesthood, and so they basically so it's basically a civil war between the sun worshippers and then the mother earth goddess worshippers, who are also very closely tied to moon worship. Uh, there's a there's a a branch of the of the priestesses who are also very concerned with um, Lala, the moon. Uh, and they have a, there's a, a they're called the Wootla, the priestesses, the voice the voices of the moon. I think it translates to in Carson, and um, uh, a lot of that kind of ties in with H. Ryder Hager, but that's another story. I won't get into that at this point. <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, so so it's very interesting. You know these little details, like you actually see that he was showing symbolically. Um, their religion through their clothing. Um, Phil was big on, on on having little details like that that uh, might just slip by you when you're reading. Uh, and similarly, you have um, you get to see what uh, the bronze helmet of a lieutenant of the guard of the Temple of Rezu looks like. It's a it's got it. There's a sunburst just above a bird's beak visor. And then uh, it has uh, seven fish eagle feathers projecting from the top like a plume. So that, that's very significant because, um, uh, you know, obviously the sunburst is the, the, uh, the uh, representing the sun worship. But the bird's beak visor, uh, the, the, the syllable race in Coke Carson also means sun. It means sun, sun god, and eagle. The, fi- the fish eagle in particular is very important. Uh, animal in uh, Coe Carson uh, society and culture, so it, it's a it represents um, authority, male authority basically. So to to see them wearing fish eagle feathers is uh, you know again emphasizing the male aspect of the sun god, and um, as opposed to the the priestesses and their mother mother earth goddess. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff that was that cut out. I think I had mentioned uh, a lot of details that were tying in um, farmers' world building with the mythology from from the Tarzan books. Um, it's nothing overt. It's a lot of very subtle uh, stuff. Um, so, for instance, there's a passage here um, where he's talking. Uh, Phil was very, very much into anthropology, so you get a lot of a lot of uh, passages like uh, the one I'm about to to read here. So, um, it's hot and understood. Chakogunga. I, it's got a lot of click consonants in there, and I'm not going to pronounce them. But <laughs> Chakogungo was an Aboriginal deity, uh, and this stone it's a it's actually these people worship a stone, so I should set the scene up a little bit. Uh, And this stone had probably been erected in her honor centuries or even thousands of years ago before the Coquelin, that's one of the groups of Coquarsen people, had conquered the Kudema area. The conquerors had absorbed the indigenes who must have been Klimkaba, the half Neanderthal people. That accounted for the short stature, heavy bones, and chuckiness of this tribe. Their language had probably been a sort of pigeon, a fusion of Clem, Clemcaba and Coquelin, with some later additions from the of the Clemsasa vocabulary. And here's where it starts getting interesting. And Co only knew what else. 
they must ha have had and might still have contact with the new, ca new car, the hairy subhumans of the forested interior. They might even have borrowed words from them. After all, Opar the Oparian do dialect contained lo loan words from the local new car. So what's interesting about that is that Phil wrote uh, an article uh, that was published in, uh, in Egeris Burroughs' fanzine called Herbdom back in 1974 called A Language for Opar. And in that language, um, he tried to uh, explore how it was that Law of Opar and Tarzan of the Apes were able to communicate with one another when they met in, in, the, in the novel The Return of Tarzan, which was published in, uh, in hardback in 1915. Um, so the, that little line that he slipped in there, uh, he's talking about the, the, the new car, the hairy subhumans of the forested interior. And if you've read Burroughs, you might realize that what he's referring to are the Mangani, the great apes uh, that raised Tarzan. And uh, by mentioning that, that uh, loan words have slipped in to the Oparian dialect from the new car, what he's doing is he's providing a way that uh, La would have known the Mangani language, the language that Tarzan learned from the great apes that raised him. Wow. So that, that little bit of, of flavor there was just struck out by the, by the copy editor, probably because they didn't realize the significance of it. Um, they didn't realize there was a connection there that he was trying to make. And, and it's that kind of thing um, that, that I'm trying to restore there. Um, oh, yeah, that's a great example. So similarly, like, just a, a tiny little line, that, like a little part of a line that was struck out um, when uh, at the end of the book, Hadan does go to Opar, and he's in the tunnels beneath Opar, and he comes across a, a, a vault deep in the tunnels, and he finds a, a brick of gold, actually a, a few, like I think he finds like two or three bricks of gold ingots, and uh, and he and Phil in his original manuscript had said, said they were shaped like two V's back to back, and if you've read The Return of Tarzan, you go and you look at the treasure vaults of Opar that, that Tarzan discovers, the gold that he discovers that later provides him with financial stability for the rest of his life. Uh, well, almost the rest of his life, he has to keep going back in the, in the Tarzan books to get gold. Uh, you'll, you'll see that Burroughs describes it as uh, the ingots as they felt not unlike double-headed boot jacks. So a boot jack is a, basically a, a V-shaped uh, thing, and a double-headed one would be two Vs back-to-back. -back. So that was Phil basically mining... Uh, mining material from the return of Tarzan uh, and just making an illusion and trying to to strengthen the, the connections between between the two mythologies. So it's stuff like that that, that whoever the copy editor was had no idea why he wrote that. They just struck it out because they were trying to tighten a line, you know, and in doing so they gutted a nice little illusion that Phil was was making. Oh boy! Well, I'm glad we got um you editing this edition <laughs> since you know a lot about Kokarsa and you know a lot about Burroughs. Yeah. Too. Fairly, so you're fairly really obsessed. <laughs> fairly obsessed with the subject. So. That's great. That's some uh, yeah. That's some good stuff for sure. Yeah, there there were there were some other subtler things that were cut. Uh, for instance, this passage here, um, uh, the situation reminded. Hada, this is from when he's uh, going down into the secret tunnels beneath Opar at the end of flight to Opar. Uh, the situation reminded Hadon of a similar setup in the palace of Meanruth, when he had escaped from the underground prison uh, with Kwasin and the others. He had climbed just such a shaft to get through a secret passage to the apartment where Awanath was imprisoned, Awanath being the queen who was deposed by her father. He wondered how many of these ancient cities had just such hidden tunnels and passageways. 
How many kings and queens have prepared escape routes only to find that what can let some out can also let others in? And that's kind of a nice little um, subtle allusion to in the Tarzan novels. Um, there are not just in the Tarzan novels, but also Burroughs' work as a whole, there are a lot of secret passages and things like that. Um, and I think that was a nod. I may be reading too much into it, but I feel like that was a nod uh, to Burroughs there. And because uh, um, the hero is always lost in these dark tunnels um, and lots of eerie stuff happens. They were, you know, they they grow up around in the darkness and are trapped there for days on end and um, and I think that was a nod a nod to Burroughs there and also showing that in one city if you're going to have passageways like this they're also going to be in another Co Carson city so that would explain how in the the cities of Tarzan's Africa why uh, all of these cities kind of have a similar blueprint essentially. Oh, because they're all derived from the same source. Yes, they're all part of the same civilization. And uh, I actually did some of that uh, on my own when I was kind of f flying on my own with some of the details in uh, the Song of Kwasin, where I had to... Uh, uh, I, I made reference to uh, a lot of the, the temples of Kokarsa, a similar structure, you know, when you went into the temple, I had them actually be the same type of building. Um, cool. So there's a there's a there's a lot of um, just cultural details that are straight farmer, straight farmerian that were cut to um, uh, cool little passages. Like um, he's talking about the Strait of Caith, which is this um, very narrow dangerous straight between uh, I should have explained that in ancient Africa the ancient Africa of farmer there are two great uh, landlocked seas um, the Kemu and the Kemu Wopar uh, the northern sea and the southern sea um, so he's describing here about the mythology behind the Strait of Caith and he says it, it is in fact a chasm a deep splitting of the mountains sometime in the past, perhaps during the creation of the world. It is said that the earth split open there to give birth to Magogo Babi, the mosquito demon, after the flaming god had lain with the mountain, which at that time, which was at that time a giant goddess. She was turned to stone by mighty Ko immediately after giving birth to the demon. Um, so it was very saturated in mythology, very steeped in, in mythology. He, um, so like having a passage like that cut, you know, to me is a sad thing. So I'm very happy to, to restore little, little bits of, uh, mythological detail. Yeah. That's a, that's a neat, uh, creation myth for the Strait of Kath from a mythological standpoint about how it was formed. Too. Yeah, he 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 really went all out with this series. It, it's it's amazing that he only uh, had published those two books for such a long time until until we revived the Song of Kwasin, um, because he had put so much world building. If you go examine his his notes as I as I have, um, it's you know I guess Tolkien esque might be a way to describe it. Um, uh, Quite, quite obsessive world building and, and quite an anthropological take on it. Um, like as I said, he he Phil had a, had a it's like I think a couple credits shy of having a master's degree in linguistics. So he created a very detailed Co Carson language, which we'll ha we will have his Co Carson language article in uh, the new edition of Flip to Opar as a, as a bonus piece oh, at the end. Great. That was previously only available in the uh, limited edition of Gods of Opar, which had a, I think, a print run of 250 copies. So this will now be available to to the wide reading audience. Cool. 
Yeah, and as far as um, his world building goes, Meteor House has a website. I believe it's called Explore the Land of Lost Kokarsa. It's it's actually uh, not Meteor House. It's actually hosted on um, the official Philip is a Farmer webpage. Oh, that's right. So I believe the URL for it would... Well, you can probably put it in oh, the show notes. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, put that in the show notes. It is uh, uh, at P- uh, if you put in Kokarsa, I think it's like the second hit on Google, so uh, you can find it that way too. Yeah, and it's got a lot of um, a lot of great world building stuff just on that site. Yes, that's the only place currently that you can find um, farmers. Uh, Co-Carson glyphs that he created. The uh, uh, Co-Carson language was built on a uh, had a syllabary as, as its basis, um, meaning that uh, it assigned specific meaning to each syllable um, and only used a certain set of syllables to create the language. So uh, that was very helpful to me to find those notes, uh, which I found quite late. I actually found them about a month before Phil passed and had written the song of Kwasin and had to make up some Co Carson names that weren't in the outline. And I had a partial syllabary at the time that he had just handwritten in his notes, um, but I didn't have the complete thing. And then I, I was at Phil's house for his to celebrate uh, his birthday a month before he passed. And um, Betty had said that I could go look in the files for more Co Carson material, and that's what I found. So I, I was able to, to revise the Song of Kwasin and put in uh, very real Co Carson sounding names. Um, you can also write in Co Carson now, thanks to finding that, right? Uh, I think there was a glyph at the beginning of. Exiles of Co. that you wrote oh, that's that right. stood yes. for Lupa Lupaway. <laughs> Am I pronouncing yes. her name correctly? Yeah, that was that was the very first uh, novella published by Meteor House, Exiles of Co., which is uh, kind of a prelude story to the Opar series. It's set uh, uh, about 800 years before Hadon of ancient Opar. And uh, Normally, their Meteor House's novellas now, they will have a frontispiece illustration, a piece of art, uh, you know, usually a, a body shot of a character. Uh, but that was before they had set their style down, so we were like, what do we put on the signature sheet? And I was like, how about the Co Carson <laughs> glyph for Lupo? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was great. It, <laughs> Just if you can just go on to that um, Kokarsa site and just look at all the world building he did, and it's just unbelievable between the plants, the languages, the chronology, all of the different races within the Kokarsa series. It's definitely very detailed, and you can tell we spend a lot of time thinking about it too definitely uh you know i think he was like i said he started thinking about this in in uh, 1972 i think and so you know it was a couple years before the first novel came out so he definitely was was doing a lot of work in preparation before he even set set word to paper um I should mention probably that the the new edition of Flight to Opar is so it's going to have the bonus material section and in that it's going to be a, a piece that I contributed called um, a guide to Kokarsa. So it's just basically a glossary of terms and, and names uh, from from the series. So I had I had the, a similar article called a guide to Kokarsa in Volume One, Hot on of Ancient Opar, that's published by Titan Books, which is still in print can find that on Amazon. That's in both Kindle and in paperback. Uh, so it's kind of a gazetteer of Co-Carson, the Co-Carson civilization. Uh, in Flight to Opar, uh, I've expanded it to include material from 
flight to Opar, so it'll include uh, terms and names from Hot on of Ancient Opar and Flight to Opar. Uh, if and when the Song of Kwasin is published, <laughs> I will put that same article in there and expand it to include uh, basically everything. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cross, crossing my fingers on that one getting <laughs> republished. That's a great book. It's looking good. So. Oh, uh, great. Yeah. Um, so there were there were a lot. Of, it's, speaking of, here's something that from Flight to Opar that was changed by the copy editor that kind of gave me a heart attack when I saw it. Um, the it's a simple little change, but uh, the. Phil had had uh, at one point in, in the adventure he said on the tenth day of the week and you know and it's like on the tenth day of the week they went out you know and did this you know and the copy editor changed that to on the tenth day uh, there's a change a very subtle change in meaning there on the tenth day of the week to a Kokarson would be like saying on Saturday because the Kokarson week is ten days long. Right. So versus on the tenth on the tenth day means ten days have passed. So when I when I wrote the song Kwasin before I did so, I, I painstakingly went through Flight to Opar and counted up every single time reference to create a chronology. And the reason I did this is because Flight to Opar and the Song of Kwasin overlap in the timeline. So what if a certain event happens in Flight to Opar and it's referred to in the Song of Kwasin, it has to be timed precisely with this, the correct passage of time uh, gone by. And uh, when I saw this, I realized that my calculations were at least 10 days off because of a change from, from you know, this tiny little change that the copy editor made Fortunately, it didn't really affect uh, any major um, plot details, so it's not like the timeline of the Song of Kwasin is screwed up, but it easily could have been, and that's why it, it, I, I nearly had a heart attack when, <laughs> when I saw that. And it's that kind of thing where you have an editor working on a manuscript, and especially with somebody so um, detail-oriented as Phil, uh, the slightest little change can, you know, have lots of different consequences that, that, you know, the copy editor might not have realized, you know. Right. Um, there, there's a, another one, <laughs> which, which is very, very important. That was a piece of uh, of text that was cut. Um, I, t I told you earlier about the um, the prophecy for Hadon's daughter that she had to be born in in Opar. Um, later, when he gets to Opar, he talks to the queen, and she talks to him about a prophecy. and And the way that it's been changed in the, the published edition, the published Daw edition, you think that it's referring to the same prophecy that he got about his daughter. Uh, and, but what was really, the, he was really referring to is a second prophecy, probably an older prophecy from before, before this book, probably from long, long ago. Um, and that has lots of consequences for later in the series. So I, I just uh, wrote a book called um, Hot on King, King of Opar, which is actually the fourth volume in the Kokarsa series, which will be coming out also hopefully at Pulp Fest this year um, from Meteor House. And in that, I had I had kind of I, I don't know I, I've read the book so many times that I must have sensed that there was a second prophecy because I had actually worked that something very similar into my to my plot based on my reading uh, there's another reference to a pro to the prophecy at a different point in the book and when I looked at it I was like this is this seems different this seems like a prophecy that people in Opar knew about the priestesses in Opar knew about 
before Hadan even got there, or before the other prophecy was even decreed. And it, but it, it was a little bit ambiguous, but I went with it uh, with my plot. What I what I found here in the Phil's manuscript of Flight to Hopar, his original manuscript, is that there was indeed a second older prophecy, and my instinct was right. Um, so so I was very very happy to see that. Um, that in there, and, and that will that has definitely been restored to, oh, wow. to the new edition. Uh, yeah, uh, do you have any other uh, questions about the new edition? Well, I just wanted to um, see, I'm just looking at the uh, Meteor House. Uh, website here for the flight to Opar. I see there's a couple new bonus features here. The three more in particular that are going to be seen for the first time. Um, I'm not sure how much you could go into these, but there's early notes on the Cocarsa series by Philip Pose Farmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, is basically some very, very early notes, um, kind of showing the evolution of the series, how he initially conceived it uh, when he first started brainstorming it, as opposed to what it eventually became. So this is kind of uh, uh, like an alternate look, in, you know, a look into the mind of Philip as a farmer and, and how it works. Uh, there are references to mythology, um, different themes in mythology. There's a list of basically a bullet point list of uh, different themes of mythology that he would that he was mining basically for this series that he wanted to utilize in the series um, and a lot of those are utilized some of them aren't but a lot of them are um, oh cool yeah that should be really interesting to see to just kind of get in the mind of Philip Pose farmer. Definitely, and he he did a lot of that. And like, for instance, like the oracles, um, uh, the oracles of Kokarsa are very closely um, ins inspired. I guess I should say inspired by the the oracles of uh, ancient Greece, down to the like three legged, tall three legged stools that they sat upon, and uh, breathing in the the sac you know the sacred fumes. So that they can, you know, have their their oracular visions and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's pretty neat to see all the different sources uh, of mythology that, that that he was thinking of that he had in mind for this series. And I, I think that gives a, a a different kind of flavor to Flight to Opar, almost a classical um, classical mythological feeling to it, like you're reading. The Odyssey, or you know, some ancient ancient Greece Greek drama. <laughs> oh, nice! So, yeah, and uh, yeah, and then we have a, a couple other bonus materials here. Yeah, the um, it looks like there's actually going to be the original outline to Flight to yes. Par in there too. Yes. Um, that that's going to be in there. Uh, so I think I, the plan so far is, as far as I'm aware, that it's actually going to be scans of his original outline. He had it's a typed outline, but he has handwritten notes in the margins and things like that that wouldn't really translate to retyping it. So um, we did the same thing in Gods of Opar, um, where whereby we printed the original outline to the Song of Kwasine and just did actual scans of the notes. Oh, cool. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. And now this uh, last one, I'm really curious to see this. It's a cross-section map of Opar drawn by Philip Pose Farmer himself. Yeah, that was really exciting when I ran across that. That, again, was a, 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 a piece that I found in... Uh, a folder that he had labeled Co Co Carson Lore. Um, and uh, it was just written on on the back of a... I can't remember what what the 
the paper was, but it was basically some scrap piece of scrap paper from like an ad for some business or something like that. And he 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 very carefully drew on the back of it a cross section of the city of Opar, and I think he was doing this to get a sense of of uh, how he was going to write um, that last quarter of flight to Opar that actually takes place in the city of Opar. Um, it's a complicated city because it has lots of tunnels and things like that. Uh, so this actually goes down into the earth and shows not only, you know, the, the temple, the temple of Ko from, from his books, but also the tunnels beneath. And it's not, um, it, you can tell he's drawing it from, from Burroughs. He's gone through, uh, the various Burroughs books about Tarzan and is trying to draw it so he can sync up his own novel uh, with those earlier works. So it's it's pretty neat. It's got treasure vaults in it and wells and shafts and um, oh wow, yeah, that's gonna be great. cool to see. <laughs> the yeah, um, so uh, yeah, that's that's it. Um, I think it, it uh, there's a there's another map cross section of Opar that I've seen that was, um, I believe, going to be published uh, alongside Heritage of the Flaming God when it was originally planned to be published in the Bros. Bulletin back in the 1970s, something that never happened, I should add. Um, and I've seen that. Uh, Phil's map is different from that map. Um, he obviously went and did his own research for this map. It's not something that he copied, although he did have a copy of that map in his, in his files, um, and had interestingly drew drew in pencil on that map and drew in the subterranean river that is referenced in Flight to Opar, which uh-huh. is not from the not from the works of Burroughs, but he was trying to think of how how the layout would be. Um, cool. Yeah, he was he was one for research, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. And like you said, I mean in Flight to Opar this is the this is really the first time he wrote a story within the city of Opar since Hayden of Ancient Op or Hadon of Ancient Opar starts with Hadon sailing away from Opar. We're not really in Opar for too long in that book. That's right. He uh, like in the very first scene, he sees Op- Opar for basically a few seconds and then it shimmers away and that's that's it and then the rest of the journey you know the, the rest of the adventure um up until the end of flight to opar in fact um is set in the larger civilization of kokarsa that was basically all of phil's invention um but when you get to that that last i'd say quarter of flight to opar it's it's Really fun, uh, a really fun section. That's uh, my favorite part of that book, probably, um, because you see Hadon running down these very familiar tunnels and crawling out the top of a very familiar boulder, although it's set in a in the middle of a lake in the Kokarsa series, uh, whereas uh, readers of of Burroughs. Um, might equate that same boulder with a giant boulder that was in the middle of a barren plain. So, you know, this is Phil again uh, showing how, you know, geologically and climate-wise, things have changed um, since the days of ancient Africa when when uh, Kokarsa was a thriving civilization. Right, since... Uh... It seems, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the bulk of the uh, Kokarsa series, it takes place at around 10,000 B.C. Yes, yeah. So 12,000 years ago, basically. So that really mm-hmm. showcases, I guess, the how, that va- how the valley that houses Opar has changed over that period yes. of time. Yeah, and... Um, 
Flight to Opar is also the, the novel that inspired me to write Exiles of Co., um, that prequel novella that I, that I was talking about earlier, um, because Lupoth is uh, the priestess heroine who discovers the valley where Opar will one day be um, be settled and created um, and constructed. And uh, so that was that is that is mentioned. She is mentioned toward the end of Flight to Opar um, as having been been the founder, and she encounters um, the indigenous peoples of the valley who are Neanderthals. Um, they're called the Gokako in, in farmer's work. And uh, there's a humorous little scene there about what the, me the meaning of the word opar means um, and, and a misunderstanding uh, because in the native language of the, of the Gokako, Opar means I don't understand you. <laughs> so and and so Lupoth mistakenly thinks that this is uh, the Gokako telling her what the name of the valley is. And so I actually wrote that humorous little scene in into Exiles of Ko um, when she rose up to the to the great boulder and meets a team of Neanderthals and they have a a classic instance of, of cultural misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, and that's another great example of how, if you read uh, the Kokarsa series as well as the Tarzan books, you're really going to get to see the big picture of what happens to this valley over time. And even... Um, Well, let me think here. I lost the word. The go, the Gogako. There, um, they seem a little bit similar to the inhabitants of Opar from Tarzan's time. Right, and I think that was that was the inference. You know, Phil, of course, was very respectful of copyrights and things like that. He did have permission to write this series, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, I've, you know, thankfully also had had permission to write this series and of of ancient Opar, not not the Opar of, of Tarzan's day. Um, but he was very respectful of trademarks and things like that, and 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 so you have to really know Burroughs really well to see the stuff that he put in there. He 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 buried it fairly deep. But if you're very familiar with it, you will recognize certain things, or certain things will seem familiar anyway. But yeah, I, the the inference is that the Gokako uh, are analogs for the uh, the frightful men, as Burroughs called them, frightful men of Opar. Cool. And uh, one thing I do want to mention about the Opar series or Kokarsa series. I'm not sure how you would categorize it. I I think it's a I think of it as a fantasy series myself, but it's pretty grounded as far as fantasy goes. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, you know he he himself felt himself regarded it as um, as a historical fiction. Um, oh, really? Yeah, there's a there's a letter that he wrote into one of the science fiction fanzines where he. He comes right out and is like, "This is really a piece of historical fiction." And if you look at, uh, I, although I don't have and have never seen the manuscript of Hadon of Ancient Opar in his um, in Phil's papers, there was the title page of his manuscript to Flight to, or, to Hadon of Ancient Opar, and in it, and on it, he wrote, um, it was titled Hadon of Ancient Opar. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the exact wording, but he referred to it as a as a Uchronia, or a piece of Uchronian fiction in the in the subtitle of it. So uh, uh, he really was thinking of it as this is kind of an, 
this is a history, a fictional backwards retroactive kind of history where he's reconstructing a, a civilization, a civilization that could have been, um, uh, and doing it with as much historical accuracy as, as possible. Um, there are seemingly magical, if you want to call it, or supernatural is probably a better word, elements in, um, in the Kokarsa series because you have prophecies that seem to come true. You have a lot of people having visions and things like that. Um, uh, I would caution the reader uh, who might, might think that those are, are fantastic elements uh, to consider also that Sahindar... Uh, this very jungle lord type character is a time traveler. He's basically the time traveler John Grabardson from Time's Last Gift, another novel by Phil, uh, which shows how this character goes back in time. So when you have a character that time travels, suddenly, uh, and then you have a series set in ancient, ancient Kokarsa, where a lot of characters are having visions, suddenly it starts to make some kind of sense. If somebody has, if there's somebody there in the civilization that has foreknowledge, um, then perhaps something there's something to do with that, you know. And that, that plays a big part of Exiles of Ko and Hot on King of Opar, um, and. I, I think that's what what Phil was getting at. There is an there is an interview from the 1970s that Phil did where he talks a little bit about um, the precognition in the Kokarsa series, um, and he was basically kind of riffing on the idea that 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 uh, in ancient times people had they were more sensitive for some reason to. Um, knowledge of future, you know, premonitions and things like that. Um, but I also think it probably had something to do with Sahindar. I mean, it's very possible that even the time ship that goes back um, way before, actually, uh, Kokarsa, that, that brings the character who later becomes known as Sahindar, brings him back in time. It's very possible that that did something uh, you know, by shooting a quantum particle or, or, or what have you, it may have actually seeded bits of future history. You know, there's that idea also that in quantum physics that time might actually be moving backwards <laughs> and that we just experience it in a certain way, but it actually might be running the other way. Huh. You know? so, so who knows, that might be, you know, a more science, Farmer was primarily a science fiction writer, you know. Um, right. So I always look at these things with a science fictional explanation. Now, from the point of view of the characters, you're going to think there are gods and there are supernatural powers and things like that. That's not necessarily what's really happening. Right. And I wanted to ask you about this, since you're... Um, I believe you have a degree in anthropology, right? Yes, I have my bachelor's in anthropology. And you're you're very you seem very much tuned in to the same type of um, li literature and subjects that Farmer himself was interested in. And I noticed in two works that that you wrote that are set in Kokarsa. Um, there was a creature involved that almost looks like a dragon, and it's actually on the cover to Exiles of Ko. Do you want to talk about how that creature could have possibly existed in our world? Sure. Um, <laughs> so that's in reference to... Uh, uh, I'm not even going to pronounce the Ko Carson name for it. Um, but that's in reference to a creature which historically has been known as, as the Sarush, um, which was a creature that was found painted on um, the gate of Ishtar um, in ancient ancient Babylon. And um, 
so there's a footnote there um, in there's a reference to this creature uh, in the first Kopar novel, Hadon of Ancient Opar, uh, that, that this is the Sarush, uh, and that they actually existed in ancient Africa um, on the shores of the southern inland sea. Um, and Phil was getting that, I believe, primarily from uh, an author named Willie Lay, who, was, who wrote science fiction. He was a pulp writer, actually. But he also um, wrote a lot of books on science and zoology and uh, um, kind of popular books um, back in the uh, 50s and 60s. And um, uh, there, he has a chapter in one of his books on the Suresh. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. I think it's something like Exotic Zoology or something like that. Um, and uh, I think that's where Phil was, was getting that from. There have also been a lot of legends uh, in Africa of, of a dragon-like creature among the different tribes in Africa. And so... You know, I think he's drawn on that. So if you if you if you count that, you know, these legends, these ancient African legends, might actually have some basis of truth in it, and you combine that with the um, the dragon that was uh, painted on the gate of Ishtar, which is a very unusual looking dragon, first of all, because it it has certain um, features that. Are, are more lion-like and certain features that are kind of lizard-like. Hmm. Um, uh, it kind of has scales on it that you can you can see. And uh, uh, so that's what he was doing. He's kind of tying all these different things together and saying, yes, there really was a basis for this creature. And of course, if you're talking about, you know, the ancient a- Africa that's inspired by, by Burroughs' Africa, there were all sorts of exotic creatures uh, that don't really exist living there. Right. And well, I think I read somewhere too that on I'm not 100% familiar with Babylon and all of its gates, but on other gates, aren't there animals painted that really existed too, which might kind of lend a little bit of credence towards the Suresh actually yeah. existing I, I think that's I think that's correct uh, I don't have have details on that but uh, that's to... that's just another really cool way to when just by looking at it you think oh it's fantasy it's a dragon but it actually has basis in reality yes you know and that's that's kind of the classic Farmerian trademark, and, and you know, like these 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 books, as you say, they do have the feel kind of of sword and sorcery, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, in some aspects, with the, the precognition and things like that, and the, um, and the, there are references in the series to other mysterious things uh, in Flight to Opar. If you remember, there's the the strange. Flute, flute playing monster <laughs> uh, that, that uh, Hadon tells a legend of as they're sailing uh, through this one one area along the sea, um, along the shore of one of these inland seas, and um, I won't spoil it for you because but it ends with a very spooky thing happening, um, which you and I have discussed before might actually tie into another book. Iron Castle. Yes, um, but I don't want to get too deep into the to the meta stuff going on here. <laughs> right. Just well, but, I guess we should say if you when you're reading Flight Dopar and you come to a chapter to this chapter and you're like, "Wow, what did that have to do to do with anything?" Definitely read Iron Castle and maybe you'll find out. Yeah, Iron Castle was a, uh, a novel, actually, not written by Phil, but um, retold by Phil, um, by J.H. Rosny, a French science fiction author from the 1920s. Um, Phil took this manuscript and he uh, 
we told it in English language and embellished it a little bit. Not too much, but he had some Walt Newton type elements to it. Um, uh, and, and this was right around the same time he was doing the Opar book, so I'm pretty certain that there was a, there was a, a reference going on there when, when he's talking about that, that creature from mythology, that, uh, that mysterious flute-playing creature. And do you think that uh, Iron Castle might be considered kind of a first cousin of sorts to the Kokarsa series? If people enjoy the Kokarsa series, oh, definitely, it's definitely in that same mold. It's of course set in um, in a later day. Uh, I think nineteen uh, twenties. I believe it's set in. Yeah, I think um, you're right. Um, so it's it's definitely that same kind of you know Burroughsian adventure story from a from a, a quite good French author. Um, you can read the original uh, translation by Brian Stableford uh, that's out from Black Coat Press. Uh, this doesn't have the embellishments by Farmer in it, but I've read both versions. They're both very, very good. I recommend that you get both of them. <laughs> if, you've, if you've read Farmer's, I recommend you, you get the Black Coat Press one and, and do a comparison. Um, and you can see that Phil took Rosny's very kind of outdated science fiction idea, a very 1920s idea where they, they didn't really understand much about evolution, and um, kind of updated it so that it had a more science fictional explanation that, that made more sense to a modern audience in the 1970s. And uh, speaking of Iron Castle, we should probably say that you and Win Scott Eckert wrote kind of a sequel, not really a sequel of sorts, but a further adventure of Harriton Iron Castle teaming him up with Doc Arden called Iron and Bronze. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we, we co-wrote that one for uh, Jean-Marc Lufissier's um, Tales of the Shadow Men uh, series and Jean Marc and, uh, and, and Randy Lafissier and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. It was, you know, I think for both of us the first collaboration that we had ever done. Um, uh, I had I had a lot of fun doing it and tied it in with uh, Pierre Benoit's Antinia series, uh, not series, uh, novel, also known as Let. Uh, Atlantide in the original French. Um, uh, had a, he had a character that was very much like Haggard's she. Um, in fact, there was a plagiarism suit uh, about that back in the day. Um, but uh, And so we tied that together and tied it together with some Farmerian type references um, in Doc Ardan, or Doc Ardan, however you want to pronounce it. I think in French you do Doc Ardon um, is an analog for Doc Savage, uh, <laughs> so it's a it's a fun story. Fun and you also br- you also brought in the axe into that one too. Yes, there's a there's a a fragment of 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 a particular axe in that story <laughs> that readers of the Song of Quasin will find very very familiar and might make some connections there. And that might even, since that takes place in the 1920s, would that be maybe one of the last known locations for it? I know that um, <laughs> we have another fragment somewhere in Yorkshire. Yes, so uh, when Scott Eckert uh, refers to fragments of an axe that were recovered from uh, Umslopogas from uh, the novel Alan Quatermain. Uh, I think it, he has has in there, there's a scene where Patricia Wildman is uh, in the library at, at Pemberley and uh, she's looking at all these various books which are 
the titles of which are basically Easter eggs from from other works of fiction, crossovers from you know, a whole assorted array of, of stories. And one of them is Fragments of an Axe, and I think it says Provenance um, Zuvendis, which is, of course, the, the lost city from Alan Quatermain that you tried her haggard. So... Yeah, the that, axe. that was yeah. great seeing that in the evil and Pemberley house. Unexpected, but very, very cool. Yeah, if if we do another episode about uh, one of the other books, either the Song of Quasine or the new Hot on King of Okar, we can go into more detail about the axe, which derives from H. Rider Haggard. Cool. Sounds good. Oh, and there's one more thing I wanted to mention about uh, the new restored edition to, to Flight to Opar. Uh, it looks like it's, besides your preface, it's getting a brand new introduction by S.M. Sterling. Yes. Um, S.M. Sterling, uh, Steve Sterling, he, he uh, contacted me out of the blue when he found out about the song of Kwasin. And basically it was like you got to send me this i've got to read this because i'm a huge fan of the of the opar book ancient opar books and so i actually sent him sent him that in advance uh and and uh and he read it and seemed to enjoy it so uh he was one of the f first names that i threw out for um for getting for an for an introduction to this book um because of his he just had so much enthusiasm for the series so i'm like i haven't read his introduction yet but i'm um, very much looking forward to it Seems oh like that's perfect. awesome yeah yeah i don't know how i do not know how fans of the kokarsa series waited so long between flight to opar <laughs> and the song of quasin I'm, I'm glad you got in there and were able to co-author that and put it out there yeah that that was uh that was uh Hard to describe what that what that meant to me to be able to to do that to to finish off this this book that Phil had started. But happy to come back on on the show and talk about the Song of Quasin, if and when a new edition of that of that book comes out. Sounds like a plan. I'll, I'll pencil you in. Excellent. <laughs> Well, I think we pretty much covered everything in regards to Flight to Opar. Um, I know you have your own personal website, cpcarry.com, and I'm going to put that in the show notes because that has a nice overview of all your books, and you also have a nice little section on there on Kokarsa that's very informative. Yeah, I tried to make a little section there that would make the series make sense. It's kind of a... Um, uh, it's interesting reintroducing this series to the, to, the, to the modern audience. A lot of people read it back in the 1970s, and that's... God's Wopar was a, was a huge success. It sold out, like, almost, you know, very shortly after publication. Um, and because uh, it's just people were just, you know... Like, like I was when I, you know, saw the the outline and, and, and partial manuscript by Phil, you know, just so excited and gleeful to to be able to see what was going to happen and how it was all going to, you know, go forward and wrap up certain storylines and things like that. Uh, Anything else you want to talk about? Or any links you'd like, or any anything you want to address? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I, I just encourage people to check out MeteorHousePress.com. Uh, we have a few different Opar, Kokarsa related books coming out from them. That that I have my I have a have a connection to. So. Uh, I would I would check out those. So yeah, the pre-order page just this week went up for Hate on King of Opar that you wrote, and there's also 
uh, hardcover of Exiles of Co., which you wrote as well. Those pre-order pages just went up this week. We talked a little bit about Exiles of Co., but yeah, I'd really like to get you back on and pick your brain about your uh, new Haydon story. That, that would be a pleasure to do. Great. Yep, I'll, we'll definitely make that happen here. Excellent. And I will put um, in the show notes, I'm going to pretty much put everything. I'm going to put a link to Hate On of Ancient Opar, which is available now from Titan Books. I'm going to put that in the show notes. I'm going to put a link to the Flight to Opar Restored Edition in the show notes. Uh, expl- I'm going to link to the Explore the World of Lost Kokarsa. I'll put a link in there. I'm going to put a link to Chris's website. Um, so if anyone out there is interested in exploring the Kokarsa or Ancient Opar series, just take a look in the show notes, and I'll have all those links there ready for you. But oh, one, go ahead. One thing, one thing I'll, I'll mention is that uh, the uh, restored edition of Flight to Opar is available in both hardcover and paperback, and both versions are going to have the same uh, text to them. So all the bonus materials will be in the paperback that are in the hardcover. So, uh, you know, go for what 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 you're you're interested in. There are a lot of people who are buying the hardcover because uh, they want the collectible nature of that. The the hardcover is going to be a limited edition, uh, a signed limited edition. I'm, I'll be signing that. Uh, the trade paperback. If you pre-order it by a certain time, it will be a signed edition, but it won't be a limited edition. That's going to stay in print. Uh, But if you want to get that hardcover, you need to order it uh, in the next couple months, basically, before uh, the uh, pre-order page for that goes away, (laughs) basically. So, Good point. And uh, there's also a deal. You can get both the hardcover and paperback as a bundle and, and save some money on it, too. So there's right. that op- there's that option there's the that option House, as well. Meteor House is is quite good about that. They they do the bundle deals on various uh, related projects, uh, and it will save you some money. So a lot of people go for that. I know I do. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great idea. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for coming on and talking Kokarsa and the new Flight to Opar Restored Edition. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I had, had, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk to you about it. Great. Well, I guess we'll see you back here later, and we'll be talking Hadon, King of Opar. Sounds great. Well, thanks, thanks again. Uh, this is Jason Aiken. And Christopher Paul Carey. And that's this week's episode of Pulp Crazy. Everyone have a great week.